Welcome to the Cool Things Entrepreneurs Do podcast with your host, Tom Singer. In each episode, we explore the interesting lives of business leaders, entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, and others who have a healthy dose of the entrepreneurial spirit. It is time to explore something cool. Now, here is your host, Tom Singer. Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of Cool Things Entrepreneurs Do. Thank you so much for pulling your chair up to the cool kids table. That's right. I have been doing this show. Gosh, we're closing in on 450 episodes in four and a half years. And the whole purpose for starting Cool Things Entrepreneurs Do was I wanted for myself to get around really smart people who were doing really cool things. Because long ago, I realized that success leaves clues. And so the more people I could talk to about their entrepreneurial entrepreneurial success, the more breadcrumbs that will be left along the trail for me. And along the way, I created this podcast. We've got well over a thousand people who listen to every episode within the first couple of days that the show comes out. And some of these episodes have had as many as eight and 10,000 downloads over their lifetime. Uh, a lot of it has to do with who the guest is. And I think today's guest, we might just set records because uh, not only is she phenomenal, However, on top of that, she's got a book that released like two weeks ago that is just going gangbusters. And if you if you haven't heard of the book Limitless by Laura Gassner Otting, then you've been living under a rock for the last couple of weeks because this book is it's really heartfelt. It's doing great things. And I can't wait to talk to Laura. But before I do, I've got to thank the first sponsor of this episode. So as many of you know, you offer physical products to your fans and your customers, but dealing with that stuff and going to the post office and mailing it and standing in line, that just sucks up all your precious time. Well, the people at Amplifier, they blend order fulfillment, screen printing, and on-demand production into a single self-service product, and they are great to work with. They're who I work with on those t-shirts that I sell that say, try new things. You can get your own Try New Things t-shirt at trynewthings.shop, and it's the people at Amplifier who are going to print it and fulfill the mailing. They integrate with your e-commerce shop. They run your giveaway campaigns, whatever you want to do, and they're great for big internet powerhouse companies as well as small entrepreneurs like myself. Hey, on demand means no inventory risk, but let's face it, as you grow, you might want to increase those margins and print 2,000 shirts or whatever it is you're printing. Hey, they can store it all in their warehouse. They take care of it. They are fabulous. Go over to amplifier.com slash cool things and sign up today. So speaking of today, a couple of weeks ago at the South by, gosh, almost a month ago at the South by Southwest conference in Austin, Texas, I had the pleasure to connect with somebody who I, I already knew her through the internet. We're part of like a double secret speakers Facebook page. And I knew who she was and, and she's always very kind and helpful in that speakers group. But she was going to be at South by Southwest speaking about her new book, Limitless, How to Ignore Everybody, Carve Your Own Path, and Live Your Best Life. And I just love that because, as you know, if you listen to the show regularly, you know back on April 2nd, I, I dropped that episode that was all about how 10 years ago I got laid off from my corporate marketing job and I decided I'm going to become a professional speaker and what did I do? I ignored everybody because all my friends were like, no, you'll never make it. You'll never succeed. You're going to suck. Uh, I carved my own path. And as I said in that episode, I have lived my best life for the last decade. It's been the best part of my journey. So everything that Laura talks about, I was so excited to meet her. And then we just hung out and hung out like two old friends. And, and now I think a month later, we are old friends because uh, we're both old. So, you know, there you go. So, Laura, welcome to Cool Things Entrepreneurs Do. Man, I love that. Right until you got up to the point where you called me old. Damn, that well, is a tough way to start the interview. I'm, I'm much older than you, so it's okay. <laughs> I'm actually okay with being old. You know, I look, I look at my age and I think every day I've lived it has given me a scar or a wrinkle or a lesson or a, you know, I, I am the sum total of everything I've been through and it's made me better at being who I really am. And I just, I love being old. It's great. I totally agree with it. I actually came up with sort of a personal mantra uh, that I talk about all the time. And that is when I turned 50, I just decided I was going to make age 50 to 75 the best years of my life. And that, that was a big challenge because I've had a pretty good life. But I have just made the decision that I'm going to try new things. I'm going to put myself out there. I'm going to be really slow to anger and really fast to forgive. And the last three years, my life has been so much better. 
and think, look at your last ten years. I mean, that's incredible. I mean, I, I, I was, I was, you know, listening and I was reading your posts about that. And you know, there's so many moments in our life where things happen to us that are out of our control. You know, getting laid off, getting fired, things just not working out, and all of a sudden you're like, is this the end? Right? Is this failure? Is this is this where it all falls apart? And then we were able to look back years later and say, actually, that was the fulcrum moment where things actually became what they were supposed to be. And people always ask me about my career and how did I get to this place and that place and the other place. And I tell them the story about how I was, you know, an accidental presidential appointee. I was an accidental recruiter. I was an accidental CEO. I'm an accidental speaker and author. And I would love to say it was all planned and strategic and and absolutely executed with precision. And the truth is, of course it wasn't. And it isn't that way for any of us. And I think that it would be a disservice for me to lie about how smart I was along the way <laughs> and have some sort of, you know, overarching theme that, that made sense. When really what it was is there were opportunities that presented themselves. And I was in a rare moment, smart enough to see them and also brave enough to act on them. And I just said yes. And I figured out the rest later. And I think that's I mean, you want to talk about cool things entrepreneurs do. That's it, right? They say yes. And they're like, I don't know. Is there, I'm going to jump out of this plane. Is there a parachute in my backpack? I think so. I'm not 100% sure. Can, and I make I know, one out like, this, can I make one out of this handkerchief? Exactly. Like, I remember seeing some 18 year old, like, fiddling with it, you know, and went on the plane. And I think he knew what he was doing, but I don't know if this is the 500th backpack he's filled or the first. And I'm just, I'm going to go for it. And I'm going to hope if the parachute's not there, the handkerchief is, right? We're gonna, that's what we do as entrepreneurs. Well, and, and I, think it, I think it is interesting. You bring up, I mean, you just start there with so much because it is so true that for so many people, it is by accident. And you said something that sort of is, is really on my mind lately, and that is, hey, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to bullshit you that somehow I was, you know, this genius and I planned it out. And I'm sort of sick of what I call the guru class. I mean, you see these people. I mean, not our speaker friends, but in the world of speakers, there are all these people who are like, you know, Fake it till you make it. Here I am in front of a fancy airplane. And hustle porn. It's the worst. Hustle porn. I it's love it. It's the worst. And, and, and they make it fronting. It's terrible. Well, and they make it look like, oh, they are so success and I so successful. And I talked to this one young guy and he was like out there and he was positioning and he'd done all these things. And and I said, Yeah, but you're not making any money. And he goes, No, but you fake it till you make it. You make other people think you're rich and then they'll pay you to get rich. And I I, I literally threw up in my mouth when he said that. <laughs> I think it's terrible. You know, we the, okay. First of all, the fake it till you make it thing, and I write about this in, in Limitless, makes me crazy because me fake it till you make it. First of all, says that you actually know what it is you want to make, and that when you get there, you're going to be happy, right? And so, you know, when I when I sat down at the age of 21 years old in the White House, right, I didn't know my head from my rear end, and and all these like bright, shiny, smart young things were walking in next to me, and I was literally sitting there wearing my mother's hand-me-down suits with like the big 1980s shoulder pads because I didn't plan to be there. I, I like happened to meet a guy on the campaign trail who happened to be the guy who assigned volunteers to the offices, and we happened to be friends. So he called me up and he's like, "Hey, they need data entry in this office. You want to go?" Um, and and I was looking at all these you know beautiful, amazing Harvard you know, brilliant people. And they're walking in with their dog-eared New York Times and they've, you know, they're sitting at, at, at the meetings and they're scribbling all these notes before the meetings start. And I'm like, oh, their heads are filled with brilliance and ideas. And I was like, I'll do the same thing. So I sat down and I, you know, I read the newspaper from cover to cover and I sat there writing my notes, trying to think of anything that made sense that, you know, wasn't like what was happening on the Friends episode from the night before. <laughs> See, old. And, um, and, and as I was doing that, what I was missing were all the conversations happening around me and all the relationships that were forming around me and all the smarts, all the clues that you mentioned that I could have been picking up had I not been so busy trying to fake it, but I was actually doing the work. So many people want to prove they're the smartest person in the room. And I find it if I'm the smartest person in the room, I can't grow. So if I, you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Right. And, and I have a problem with the whole fake it till you make it thing because I think it's telling people, especially you know the up and comers, the youth of the world, Go out there and be a fraud. And the reality is go out there and be yourself and try hard and, and throw yourself against, you know, a few walls and see what you break through. Absolutely. I mean, I, when I tried to 
fake it till I make it. It turns out that I was trying to become one of these bright young things. And I'm just, that's not who I am. I am not somebody who leads with my brains. I'm somebody who leads with my guts. I've always been that person. And I, I create impact and change and progress and build things because I'm passionate about them. And I throw myself into them, not because I've logic to myself all the way through. So when I was trying to be those super smart Harvard, you know, Ivy leaguers, I, I, I was never going to be them. In fact, not only was I not going to be them, I, I was just going to be iterative versions of them. So I wasn't even going to be as good at it, even if I did figure out how to fake it. So all these people that are standing in front of these jets that are not theirs, but they just snuck onto the tarmac or, you know, they've rented the fancy car for the day and they're like having, you know, they're standing there with all their cash or just like empty their bank account to do it. Let them busy themselves fronting and posing. And while they're doing that, we all build our businesses and we actually make real stuff with real substance. I mean, we could end the interview right now. And I think all the listeners would be like, bam, that was a great interview. (laughs) But I'm going to back up a step because one of my favorite stories about you and you, you touched on this is you, you went to the University of Texas, Hook'em Horns, here in Austin, Hook'em where Horns. I live. And uh, after that, you went to law school for, really? like, for like an hour and a half. But, <laughs> but you dropped out of law school to go to work for the Clinton administration. How in the world did that happen? So I grew up um, at a time when... Uh, people watched the six o'clock news, and at the end of the six o'clock news, I loved the, the six o'clock news. I love this, and the, you, you remember the anchor would come out at the end, and they would give their opinion piece, and it wasn't an opinion piece like fake news or you know the, the green agenda or whatever side of the party you're on. It was just they would they would talk about the world, and they would say things like you know the local city government should do this for school children, or we should do these things for you know hostages in Iran, or like whatever the small, big, large, whatever it was, and they would talk. And then we would turn it off. And as a family, we would talk about the issues. And I, I thought that leaders were the people who were in the spotlight. They were the ones who were always on the stage and, and they were the CEO and they were the ones who were the elected officials. And I thought, okay, well, if that's the definition of a leader, which I've come to learn is not the only definition of a leader. But when I, I thought that was the only definition of a leader, and if that's what I want to do and I care about the world generally – I should probably run for office. I should probably be the first female senator from the great state of Florida, right? I grew up in Miami. And P.S. there still has not been a female senator from the great state of Florida all well, these years later. It, it's not too late. It's, well, I smoked a lot of pot in college. It's probably too late. <laughs> not anymore. Not anymore. Now that's like how you get, now you could run for president. That's true. I mean, you know, I, Beto, I smoked a lot of pot. Apparently, people love him for that, so that's great. Um, the problem is I inhaled a lot, and so I don't remember all of the things. I wouldn't remember all the people along the campaign trail, and I probably wouldn't be able to get a lot of votes. We'll get, but, you, we'll get so, you a handler. Yeah, we'll get a good handler. That'll, be, that'll, that'll work. And so I'm there, and I'm thinking, you know, in grade eight, I am going to run for office. I'm going to solve all the problems. I am going to be the solution. And so uh, a, a, a teacher told me very early on that I was very argumentative, very argumentative young woman. You should really become a lawyer. And of course, you won't be surprised to know that I told her she was wrong. <laughs> but I did form the next 10 years of my educational path, getting me to, on a path to go to law school, where I sat down the very first day and I looked around and I was like, okay, I want to run for office. Everybody I have ever seen who's an elected office has either been you know, a World War II vet, which obviously I'm not going to be, or a lawyer. So I should be here. But this is like not right for me. I do not admire the, my, my, my colleagues. I'm not interested in what the teachers are saying. Like, this is just, it was like organ rejection. I was in the wrong place. <laughs> so um, I'm dating. I, I was so unhappy in my life that I was dating one of those guys that, you know, you should never date, right? Or maybe you should date, but never marry. And he, it was raining that day in school. I was riding my bike to campus and he said, well, you know, it's raining. I'll give you a ride home uh, in my IROC Z, right? Tells you what kind of guy you are. I can write Sounds on my like there was a gold thing. chain involved somewhere around his neck. Yeah, there was a gold chain. There was, you know, like metal. It was, it was the full on like self hatred experience of, you know, like being in your in your early twenties. So we drive, um, we drive to this uh, strip mall, which is back in the day before the internet, where you got information about somebody running for office. And in the corner of the office was this little black and white TV, which then Governor Bill Clinton talking about this idea of community service in exchange for college tuition. And I walked in and I listened to him speaking so passionately about how there was nothing wrong with America that can't be fixed with what's right with America and that giving people an opportunity to serve their community 
so that they could take that, 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 that those resources and make themselves better seemed to me to make so much sense. And in a heartbeat, I went from saying, how can I help? How can I be the solution to that needs to happen? We need to get him elected and that's the right solution. And what role can I play in helping make that solution real? And so I dropped out of law school because I just, I saw that I was not, you know, the end all be all of the solution. It wasn't that, but it was about getting the right people in the right places. It was about putting the right talent in the right places so that they could put all of their energy towards the solution. And I dropped out, I joined the campaign trail and like hundreds of other, you know, young and idealistic individuals, I just threw everything I had at this and I was, you know, worth my weight in, in ramen soup and <laughs> spent a lot of time eating, you know, cold pizza and sleeping on high school gymnasium floors. And lo and behold, this, you know, unknown governor from this tiny Southern state got elected and I ended up walking into the White House at 1201 on inauguration day. Wow. And then you got appointed to do what? So then uh, I spent six weeks uh, I spent six weeks doing data entry as a volunteer, um, realizing that if I didn't get a paid job by week seven, I was not going to be able to pay my rent on week eight. So I had to figure it out. And as I was walking at, I was doing data entry in the office. I was going to create the national service program, the AmeriCorps program. And as I was walking out of the office on day seven, there was a sign up sheet to donate blood. Um, I don't, this is actually a funny story. I don't tell this that often. And every entrepreneur listening to this is going to say, yes, I get it. There's a sign up sheet and there were four slots per hour. And I noticed that there was an hour that had three people signed up. One of whom was Eli Siegel, the guy who was running the office of national service, who ran the 1992 presidential campaign. And there was a fourth slot that was empty. <laughs> so I signed oh, I my love, name. I love this story. Okay, now here's the thing about this. I had this very unexciting, um, non-fatal, non-contagious um, thing called vasovagal syncope, which basically means I have very low blood pressure. And when I get super anxious or my blood sugar is really low or say I give blood, I tend to pass out. <laughs> Still, I see the slot and I'm like, well, it's week seven. I've got week eight. I've uprooted but, my But I could sit life. next to Siegel. <laughs> I better figure this out. So I go to give blood and I'm laying on the cot, like the cot next to his cot. We are literally like a trapped audience with IVs in our arm. And he's like, he's like, so who are you? I've seen you in the office. I have 15 minutes while we're bleeding out to tell him who I am and pitch him and try to convince him that he should hire me and then wait, hoping that he bleeds just a little faster than I do so that he gets up and leaves first so that he doesn't see me pass out cold after I get up from giving blood. I literally bled for this job. <laughs> that is so and and you're right that the people with the entrepreneurial spirit immediately go, "Aha, that's exactly what you do. You yeah, sign you up and give blood so you can be next to the guy." Yeah, you see an opportunity. I was like, "Well, you know, I I I had one shot. I knew I had to do it. I knew that I am in the White House, right? Like you have to do something that sets you apart." And so he says to me, well, you know, if you're interested in doing something more than just data entry, I've got a research project uh, I'd love a little help on. You see, it, it, it occurs to me that Kennedy was successful with the Peace Corps the minute he announced it, whereas Johnson, LBJ, his war on poverty was basically dead in the water before it even arrived on day one. Do you think he'd go figure out why that was? <laughs> oh, okay. That's a small task. Sure. Right? Sure. No problem. Um, so I scurry, you know, to, to get all of my stuff together. I run to the Library of Congress. I start doing all this research. And when I, when I, um, on the way out the door, the, the woman who is, uh, one of like a, the, the, the more senior people in the office is like, yeah, so, you know, you're going to have to give that report to the chief of staff and he's going to summarize it for Eli, but you may want to give Eli the raw material also, because if you don't, he's never actually going to know what you did. He's never going to see your brilliance. And so I, I, you know, I went around the chain of command. I, I went over, you know, the chief of staff's head. I gave the stuff directly to, to, to Eli. I mean, I, I, I did everything I had to do in that moment where it was like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to back slowly away. And I don't know if I'm going to pass out from giving blood. I don't know if I'm going to get fired for insubordination from the job. I don't even yet have any of that stuff. But, you know, you have these moments where you say, this is do or die. I put all the stakes down. I dropped out of law school. I uprooted my life. I'm living in a rat infested basement apartment because I believe so deeply in this thing. 
And so I did it and I, and, and I gave it to him and I, and I, I, I was terrified for 24 hours and I walked back into the office the next day and he's like, hey, I read your report. That was really terrific. Uh, I talked to Rick. He's going to put you on salary. Boom. And there I was, a presidential appointee, 22 years old, working in the Clinton White House. Nice. That's great. And you weren't an intern. <laughs> and I was not, not. I mean, I was probably around the same age as the interns, but, you know, we were huge snobs. We were on salary. I had, I had an actual hard pass. <laughs> <laughs> insert so, joke here so you didn't but, you, <laughs> you didn't you didn't hang out with any any interns who might have gotten famous since then i did not hang out with that you know we were thank god we were so narcissistic uh and such snobs that we refused to hang out with interns because boy that would have been a that would have been an in, I, I would have had a whole other speaking career <laughs> I, I, I was just gonna say you didn't want to be the person who was getting those secret phone calls where she was lamenting so uh, no, but I did, know those, I did know those people. <laughs> yeah. So so you worked for the White House. You worked on AmeriCorps. You did all that. Then you went in into the recruiting world, and and you worked for someone for, for several years. And then one day, you decided, to hell with working for somebody else, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. And really, I mean, if we go back and look at leaving law school, that was very entrepreneurial. So you've always had this entrepreneurial flair. But after you went into corporate America, what caused you to leave corporate America? Well, you know, so I was working in a recruiting firm where we were doing exclusively nonprofit work and we were finding the leaders of, you know, insert major international nonprofit here, CEO. We were doing big, big stuff that was changing the world. And I, I just felt constrained by the model. I, in my brain, thought I was on the same side of the table as my clients, right? We were, I, we were curing cancer. We were feeding the poor. We were, we were saving the whales. And, and you know, I, I was there on the same side of the table with them. But, I mean, not really because that would be, like, cozy and weird. But <laughs> I, 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 in my brain, we were all doing the same thing. And then one day I realized in their brains, I was actually on the other side of the table, right? I was on the side of the table with my boss and our P&L sitting in between us. And, and I had two masters and I, I felt really frustrated in this professional services firm that the, the clients who were paying us the most, who frankly, the work I felt was the easiest to do, were the ones that I was incentivized to spend the most amount of time on, where the clients that were having such a hard time, where the fees were lower because they were smaller in terms of the, what they were paying us. I just, I, we were, not, I, they were getting like the last 5% of my attention. And I thought that the money meant so much more to them. You know, finding the chief strategy officer for the Ford Foundation is a lot easier than finding a, a, a fundraiser for a local domestic violence shelter. And I just, it just didn't feel right to me. And I felt in my gut that we could do it faster and better and with more profits and with more authenticity and in, in ways where everybody won. And I marched into my boss's office and I was like, here's the way we should be doing it. And he said, thank you very much. See you later. And I mean, I just, once I realized that I was part of the problem, I couldn't keep, I felt complicit, right? Like once I realized that, that I was, I was, part of the way that we were doing it, that part of the machine that was, that was not serving our clients as well as I thought we could, I, I, I couldn't keep doing it any longer and I had to do it my way. And again, I think it's a thing that entrepreneurs do all the time. Like once you see the solution and once the solution is clear to you, you can't keep living in the problem because you just, it's, it, it eats at you every day. It's like poison. And I just felt like if I were not fixing it, then I was breaking it and I wanted to stop breaking it. So I walked out in, in this moment of rage. I was um, pregnant. I had with my first child, my, um, my husband was still in the part where he was building his career. We had like $17 in the bank and I, and I, and I had no plan, but I knew what I wanted to do. And that business went on for 15 years before you sold it to your employees so I, I, I want to make sure we have time to talk about your book. So I'm not intentionally fast forwarding through your entrepreneurial career, which is amazing. But uh, I want to make sure that we're getting deep into Limitless. But before we get there, so you did that for 15 years. You sold the business to your employees. So you have been on all sides of this career journey, especially having worked as a recruiter. You have seen so many things. So what advice would you have for someone who's listening to the show? Because the people who listen to a show called Cool Things Entrepreneurs Do, most of my listeners either want to look at their boss and say, I can do this better, bye-bye. 
or they've done that at some point and they're, they're still trying to grow their career, what advice do you have for somebody who's either thinking about it or has recently started that trek out on their own? What would you tell them? Oh, I would tell them that the perfect is the enemy of the good. Ooh, I love that. And that's a lesson that, I mean, Eli Siegel, who ran the Office of National Service, he ran America, used to say that all the time. When you're trying to start something, if you wait until it's perfect, you will never get it out the door. And if it's, you know, minimal viable product sometimes is, is, is enough to at least get going. And then you can iterate and you can innovate from there. When I when I walked out of out of the big marquee fancy firm, everyone thought I was crazy. I mean, I made I was like the youngest vice president to to ever make it. I mean, I was I was I was on the upswing, right? You were like, the, you were were the great. it. You were the it girl. I was the it girl. I was the it girl, and 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 I, and I walked out, and then I had. 24 hours of labor in an unplanned C-section. And so six weeks later, I was still like sitting there kind of not really able to walk that well on my own with this alien t- in my arms, <laughs> right? This like child. I was like, I don't know who you are, but you- you're coming along for the ride now. And the phone rings and it was a friend of mine back from my White House days. And she calls me up and she's like, so, um, ew, I heard you had a baby. Um, <laughs> that's cool, I guess. But um, the CEO of my organization just left and I, you do search, right? Like, can you do the search for us? That was the phone yes. call. Yes, I can. And now, you know, I guess lecture in entrepreneurship classes and I like to tell the story of what, you know, what I've done and inspire people and all that great stuff. And there's always some young woman in the back who's like, how long did it take you to write your business plan? <laughs> and I'm like, I didn't have a business plan. I had business. I didn't have any plan. I just, I had one project and I did that one really well. And then good work begets more good work. And so if you just keep doing really good work, then people notice it and they pay attention and you get more of it. And if I had waited until I'd had this business plan perfectly set in stone with everything and every fail safe accounted for, I never would have started. And then there's always somebody else who says, well, what would you do if you failed? And what I think is interesting about that question is I just ask them the question back, right? Like, what would you do if you failed? And the answer is always, well, I don't know. I mean, I guess I go get a job in a cubicle and I'd, you know, work until I figured out my next business. And I was like, great. So you know what you do if you failed? What will you do if you succeed? Wow. That's, yeah. What would you do if you succeed? And the answer is always silence. It's crickets. And so I say, you spend more time worrying about that. Right? Like, if you spend all this time, like, you know what you're going to do if you fail. So, like, stop worrying about the failure and stop worrying about the perfection and just get on with it already. Just go. So, I have a daughter who's about to graduate college in a matter of a month, and she has opted not to go big, giant corporation. I mean, she went to a top undergrad business program so that she could go to a bank or Wall Street or some Fortune 100 company. And instead, she's you know, she's probably going to take a job to pay the rent, but she's trying to start her own business. And I'm going to make her listen to this episode. Hi, Jax. I love you. Uh, she does not listen to my podcast regularly, but I'm going to make her listen to this one because what you just said is exactly the best advice for a new startup you know, entrepreneur, I think is exactly, I mean, I'm, I'm tingling. I think that is exactly the best advice someone, someone can get. So I got one more question before we move into the book, and that is, so I speak about this gap that exists between potential and performance. And I've interviewed on this show like 400 entrepreneurs or more, and in, I've done a survey of another 500, and I ask people all the time who've been successful, how come some people get farther across that gap between potential and results than other people? What do you think the delta is? How come some people fall into the abyss and other people are able to, to create a path across it? Oh, well, that is such a fascinating question. And, and I think it's a good lead in to the book, uh, actually. Um, although I will say before we go on, Jax, your dad is super cool. You should always listen to his episodes. He didn't pay me for that plug. Um, but uh, I think that, I think that, uh, I think there are a couple things that happen. And, and it's interesting. I'm, I'm actually sort of suffering a little bit from this right now myself. I'm this book, which you know I didn't intend to write, which all of a sudden is getting a ton of attention and is kind of overwhelming me. Um, has it's kind of shocked me. And I was talking to my husband about it, and he said, he said, you know, he said you're suffering from the burden of potential, where there's all these expectations and you feel this need to get it right, like this really deep burden to you know if you've always been 
the it girl, if you've always been the superstar, if people have always praised you, um, you, you, you are, it's so scary to not live up to the potential of something that you don't want to underserve it. And because this is for me, something that is such a personal, it's a, it was a screed, right. That my editor really toned down to make into a book. Um, but it, it, it came out of such a core part of, of me that I think, I think that we get trapped sometimes and that I want to make sure that I'm, I'm doing well enough. And so I think that's the, that's the first thing is a sort of burden of potential. And I think that leads in to doing hard things. I think a lot of times as adults, we get paid and we get praised to live in the center of our excellence, to like be the person who has done the good thing all the time. There's something that you know how to do well. In high school, you majored in college. And when you major in college, then you get a job doing it. And then when you get that, you get promoted and, and you become you know the senior vice president of that thing, of your center of excellence. And we never step outside of it for fear of failure, for fear of not being perfect. And you know we think, think about Kids, when you're kids, we're constantly learning new things, right? If you figure out algebra, you go on to, to geometry. You've got geometry, you go on to trigonometry. You figure out trigonometry, there's calculus. And, and you're expected to not know things. You're expected to, to, to fail and to grow and to, be, you know, iterative processes. And so I, I think that some people don't get further along because they're so paralyzed by the idea of failure being finale and not being fulcrum, that they don't let the, the, the falling down and the getting up let them grow even further and catapult them even further along the way. And, and you sort of have hit the nail on the head of what my research shows, and that is people tend to do what comes easy for them. So people who are find math easy become mathematicians and engineers and, and, and things like this, whereas so few people say, wow, this is hard. I'm going to double down and go back and do more of it. And I talk a little bit on the show about how a year ago, a uh, mutual friend of ours, Drew Tarvin, brought me to an open mic night and convinced me to get up in New York City at a comedy club and do a five-minute open mic night set. And I always say that, you know, Jerry Seinfeld is not worried about job security because I did that. I mean, I wasn't that good. <laughs> I didn't bomb, but I wasn't that good. Uh, and yet, I knew there was something to learn. And what I discovered over the last year is that as a professional speaker who's given more than 800 talks in my career— what I've discovered is, is that stand-up comedy is harder. It might be the hardest use of the spoken word ever. And so I made a commitment that I was going to do 100 open mic nights. And I will be honest, for about the first 35, I bombed a lot. I wasn't that good. I didn't understand even how open mic night in a coffee house even worked. And yet, I recently got asked to do a show, and I did it. Uh, I spoke in Tucson last week, or last week from when we're recording this, three weeks from when it'll air. But uh, the next day, my phone rang, and it was this guy, and he said, I know this is weird because you live in Austin. Did you do an open mic night at a bar in Tucson last night? And I was like, yes, weird stalker. Yes. <laughs> yes, I did. And he said, look, I book for a monthly show here in Tucson. How often are you in Tucson? He goes, because I thought you were really funny, and if you've got 20 minutes of material, I would put you on before one of my headliners. Now, I probably have 20 minutes worth of material, but it's not ready for prime time. Secondly, I don't think I've been in Tucson twice in my life, so it's not like I'm going to be back there where I can go do this non-paid comedy show. But that being said, I was not at that level a year ago, and this did not come naturally for me. And what I discovered in my own life is I spent a lot of time with my in sales and marketing because I was good at it with my ladder against the wrong wall, chasing someone else's dream. And now I realize that your dream might be hard. And I think a lot of people fall into this thing where they just get on a path and stay on the path. So I, I sort of commend your answer there because it, it struck me at the core. But so here's my question, um, because I think you and I are made of the same stuff. Isn't there like no small party that's like, I wonder if I could develop a recurring client in Tucson and see if I could do 20 minutes of material. Isn't there a party that's like, hmm, yes. interesting. I'm also running like, so what would an Airbnb in one flight cost? Uh, and then the other thing is, is that it's like when I started the comedy thing, some young comic who was about 25 said, is this what you want to do? Do you want to be a comic? And I said, no, I don't think so. And he goes, well, good, because you're starting kind of late because uh, you're old and it takes like 10 to 15 years to really get established where you'd ever get like on the tonight show or get a Netflix special. And there was a little part of me that said, screw you punk. You know? I mean, grandma Moses didn't pick up a paintbrush till she was 80. Right. So, I mean, you know, so what if I was on the tonight show at 65, 
I'd still be on The Tonight Show and this guy will be a barista. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I, th- I, I think anybody tells you it's too late for anything is yeah. totally wrong. With, with, I mean, I think without that's, question. That's, that's, that's malarkey. That's just right. nuts. That, Absolutely. That being said, I'm not pursuing a career in comedy. However, there's the side of me that says, if I want to, I can. Absolutely. I mean, I love it. Look, I think, I think that, um, I think it's not just that we say, I'm not going to do the thing that's hard and I'm not going to do the thing that scares me. I think there are also people along the way who define us. And um, this guy is trying to define you as quote unquote too old, right? When I was in sixth grade, I had a teacher who made us uh, do the rote memorization tables. One times one is one, one times two is two, one times all the way up to nine times nine is 81. And the way he would test us, he would put all the boys on one side of the room and all the girls on the other side of the room. And he would bring us up one by one you know, like family feud style, right? Like facing each other. <laughs> and you would have to do the multiplication tables as fast as you possibly could and finish before the other person. And we happened to be in a classroom with a bunch of boys who spoke really, really fast. And the boys won. And the teacher, I remember him saying, his name was Mr. Tannenbaum. And I remember Mr. Tannenbaum, who was like six foot five, saying in a super baritone voice, well, I guess the boys are just better at math. And Ouch. Yeah. Right. So I who I am a person who is a serial entrepreneur and yet I never pursued math, finance, business, any of it, because Mr. Tannenbaum in sixth grade told me you can't do math. So I had the same thing happen in eighth grade. I had an English teacher. I was in um, they called it MGM. I think later they changed it to gate. I don't know what they call it now, but it was essentially for the smart kids. Right. If you if you tested well, you got put in this special program. And from like sixth grade forward. So when I was in eighth grade, I was in the MGM math, I'm sorry, MGM English program. And the teacher one time said something about what do you want to do? And I said, I want to be a writer. And she said to me in front of the class, you barely deserve to be in this class. Your, your spelling and your grammar are atrocious. You'll never be a writer. That's and I, malpractice. <laughs> and I never, pr- yeah, I'd love to run into her someday and just point out, I'd love to give her all 12 of my books and say, you know, clearly two things that this woman was not a visionary. She did not know spell check would ever appear, which has done <laughs> wonders for those of us who can't spell. And second of all, she didn't realize that people who published books have editors. And so, you know, it's like, I'd love to hand her my books and say, here you go. I've written 12. Now, I never have written fiction, which is what I wanted to do back then. Uh, but yeah, they define you and they, and they put you in a box. So, yeah. hey. So then you walk back in one day and you're like, you're like Julia Roberts and Pretty Woman. You're like, big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> right? Here's a boom, mic drop, book drop. Here are my 12 books. All right. We are running very long on this episode and I don't <laughs> care. So I'm going to uh, thank the other sponsor of this episode. And then we are going to find out about Limitless. So this episode, like so many of them, is brought to you by Podfly Productions. Podfly takes the time and the headache out of creating your own podcast. They set you up with the right equipment, training, and guidance to ensure that you sound amazing. Podfly does all the heavy lifting and the technical work so that you can focus on creating great content, growing your audience, and interviewing really cool people like Laura Gassner Otting. Hey, if you want to start a podcast, and I know that some of you do, jump over to podfly.net slash cool things and check out the special offer that they have for the listeners of this show. So, Laura, I wanted to bring you on the podcast because I think this book, like I said, it's getting all kinds of attention. You're being asked to speak all over the world. Everybody is doing it. One person who read your book tattooed the logo of the book on their arm. I saw this on Facebook. So clearly it is touching people at a place where they're willing to tattoo it on their body. Let's talk about what is the message behind Limitless. So the message is a lot of what we've been talking about so far. It's clearly, you know, in the bones of me, it's in the bones of you, it's in the bones of entrepreneurs, this idea that when we pursue success as defined by everybody else, and we fill in all the right check boxes along all the right paths to somebody else's idea of success, we turn around one day and we go, all right, well, so I did all the right things. I was the good doobie. All the boxes are full. Why do I feel empty? Why is there something missing? Why is it not enough? And what I learned over the course of interviewing thousands of people at the top of their game um, in executive recruiting, and frankly, at the top of their game in purpose-filled 
careers, nonprofit filled careers, was that they weren't all happy either. And I was so struck by this idea that success didn't equal happiness. And so I sat down one day and I thought, well, success doesn't equal happiness. Well, then what does? And I looked at the people who were actually happy. And I looked at my own career and the changes I made very specifically along the way that made me happier. And I realized that that if success doesn't equal happiness, it's not because of the achievement of success. It's not this hustle porn idea of leaning in to success. It's the definition of success. And the problem is that we're letting other people define it for us. So in the book, I talk about this idea wrapping around the framework of consonants, that it's not until we're in consonants, in alignment, in flow, where everything that we do, where what we are matches well, what we do matches who we are that we can actually feel happy because when what we do matches who we are we're able to bring the very best of ourselves to the thing that we hold dear to the causes we love to the people that we love to the work that we really want to do and so the book creates a framework for people to finally start ignoring everybody else and create that consonance for yourself so you talked about leaning in and that of course reminds me of the famous book that sort of is of that title about women about how to sort of lean into the work and, and things like that. Uh, it sounds like your book's a little bit uh, in, in, in uh, conflict with what uh, that book says. Well, it's interesting because the book originally started off with the first line, I wanted to love lean in, but I didn't. And my editor, uh, my, my publisher wrote back and said, mm, you know, she lost her husband. That might be kind of mean. Do you, you really want people, Facebook to hate you? You don't want Facebook to hate you and not, you know, let you market your book, right? All these different things. And, 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 and also he said, you know, and it's not really the anti-lean in. That's like a small part of it. But it's, you don't want people to think this book is the lean out, right? That's not what you want. Um, and, and so I, I moved it down. And there's a section in the book called The Trouble with Leaning In. But I will tell tell you, a few months ago, Michelle Obama got a ton of, of headlines for saying, yeah, lean in. Sometimes that don't work, right? <laughs> so, so I should have started that way. Well, when, um, you, but- when you spoke at South by Southwest, you said this, and I was sitting near some women who afterwards I heard them talking and they said, I totally get what she was saying. I mean, that comment of I wanted to love lean in and what, what, what Sheryl Sandberg had to say, but I just couldn't get there or however you phrased it, really resonated with the women who were sitting around me. Yeah, I thought I was supposed to love it. I mean, I have a uterus. I'm part of like the army of women. Like we, it, like with the uterus comes the the, you know, the the need to love, lean in, and and I did. I loved it when I first read it because I loved the idea. Grab the the the, the brass ring, put yourself in the deal flow. Be you know, get to the corner office as fast and as expediently as you can, and use every bit of privilege that you have along the way to get there. And I did that. I used that absolutely. And I wanted to love it because that method worked for me until it didn't work for me. I would turn around one day and I was like, okay, so I got to the top. I got to the corner office. I'm, I'm at the top of the top of what? And is this really where I want to be? And, I, and it was in that moment where I was sitting across from a client saying, I'm doing the good work. I've got the paper life that is right, but it's just, it's, 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 it's not right for me. It doesn't feel right for me because it's not actually right for me. And, and the, I, my issue with lean in wasn't the way she achieved success, right? I mean, she would have been folly not to use all the privilege and everything else she had. I did it. She did it. Obviously I had a few less zeros behind my name, but my issue wasn't how she achieved success. My issue was how she defined success. This idea that one unflinching myopic definition of, you know, all things to all people to get to the top as fast as you possibly can, that that's not going to work for everybody. That's not what everybody wants. I mean, your daughter is not leaning in. And my guess is that your daughter is going to be pretty successful because she knows what she wants and she's defining in a way that works for her and not the way that everyone's saying, oh, well, you just went to this great school and you just got this great MBA. And of course, you should go get you know, a job in a you know, marquee, big, giant building somewhere in a you know, suffocating downtown. That might not be her jam. And that's awesome that she knows that now. Well, I always say the one regret I have is I didn't start my own business earlier. So when I have friends who say, you know, and, and she doesn't have an MBA, she has her undergrad, but still people who say, you know, she went to one of the most expensive colleges in the country. How do you feel about her not pursuing a Fortune 100 job? I say, you know, she wants to carve her own path. I, I didn't have the guts to do it when I was 22. And is it going to be hard? Yep. Is she going to struggle? Probably. But, you know, she's going to figure it out. And like you said earlier is... You know, she doesn't make it. She'll, she's scrappy. Her her secret weapon, 
I mean, honest to God, since she was like five years old, is her work ethic. I have never been around anybody besides her and my wife and my other daughter who have this natural work ethic that if they know what they're trying to do, just get out of their way. And it's like a bulldozer. Once they know, you know, they'll do the work. So I, I'm actually not worried about her. So the thing about the thing about your book that I haven't read it yet, but the thing that really stood out was when I held it in my hands, I bought a copy at South by Southwest and I, the subtitle, because I'm, I want to touch on these three things before I let you go. It is how to ignore everybody, comma, carve your own path, comma, and live your best life. Those three things are everything that I stand for and I believe in and I'm doing now. I wasn't doing it at 22 necessarily, but let's take the first one. How do you ignore everybody? That's hard. I spent 25 years of my career trying to please you know, my parents, doing what people expected me. I was married with kids. I tried to be a good provider. I did what the community expected. I volunteered. I did all that. How do you, how do you ignore everybody? Well, I think the first thing you have to do is you have to just say, screw the Joneses. You know, those like super perfect, that perfect family with their perfect beach photo with the perfect sunset. And, you know, the ones that everything is always perfect all the time and say, you know, we are, as we said in the beginning, we are all made up of our scars and our divots and our mistakes. And we have to stop judging our, our, our bloopers by everybody else's highlight reels. You know, we spend all of this time saying, well, that person has the perfect career, the perfect marriage or the perfect labradoodle that never pees on the rug. And, you know, that's not real life. So I think the first thing is to say what, number one, all of that is highlight reel. That's fake as can possibly be. That's the guy with the, with the jet and the cash and the rented car that's not really actually his and say, okay, I know that that's fake. Number two, just because that's what makes them happy doesn't mean it's going to make me happy. So, you know, if you take the metric of money, for example, um, if you're in a job that, that pays you the amount of money that you need to make, you're going to probably be pretty happy. And there's probably a number somewhere above that. That's a number that you want to make. And the delta between what you need to make and what you want to make is, is you know, how fancy the vacations are you're going to take. You know, how fancy the car is that you're going to have. Um, how, how, you know, how fancy the house is that you're going to live in. And, People want different things for that. So if you spend all your time saying, well, this person went to that um, on that vacation or this person drives that car, so I should too, then that's just trying to keep up with the Joneses. And I think when you're doing that, then you're working for all the wrong reasons. So I, I have to say, you know, in the business that, that we're both in, in, in the speaker business, there are a lot of people who only put out there the, the highs and the fancy and, and, and the things like that. And it is hard because you see it and you're like, well, my, my business doesn't look like that. And it's, it's hard to get over not, you know, trying to be shiny like that. When I ran my recruiting firm, I had a choice that I could make. I could either do what the big marquee firm was doing and maximize every bit of profit at every moment and work 24 hours a day, seven days a week and never take a vacation. Or I could run the firm for what I cared about, which was maximizing impact in, in the world and flexibility in my life. I had a young marriage. I had a young family. I was involved in my community. I was involved in political campaigns. There were other things that were going on. And I knew that my need to make number was enough to pay the mortgage. And the want to make number was everything on top of that. So I, I, I created a budget for the, for the firm that I could build a firm that would throw off at least enough for the need to make number. And everything above it was, 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 was gravy. And what I did was I sacrificed some of the maximizing of every single bit of profit so that I could maximize the other things I cared about also, the impact in the world, the flexibility to be there for my family. And I apologize to no one. The fact that I was, you know, a young mom and I had young children and sometimes I'd show up at the play group and the moms would be like, wait, but I thought you had a job. And sometimes I was at work and people were like, but I thought you were a mom, right? Nobody could understand exactly what I was because I decided not to let them put me into a specific box that said you're either this or you're that. And I said, you know what? The fact that I can send out invoices at 10 p.m. on a Tuesday means I can show up for mommy and me music class at, you know, 7 a.m. on a Wednesday. I can go to the gym at noon on a Thursday. My work was client focused and I needed to be there for my clients when they needed me. Absolutely. And I had to be able to have enough oversight and accountability to manage my, you know, the, the, the team, the, the, the very large growing team that I, that I, that I had. But I also, you know, I wasn't that important. I didn't need to be there all the time, every single minute of every single day, because I knew what metrics I cared about. And the metrics I cared about were make enough money, 
maximize my flexibility, maximize the impact I was having on the world. And I was able to use them like a stereo mixing board to have a little bit of one, a little bit of the other and mix them around so that I could have what I needed at exactly the right time because I was defining success for me and not the guy with the jet and the fake, you know, the fake Rolls Royce. So ignoring everybody else seems to lead straight in to carve your own path because we, we seem to have sort of covered that. Is there anything more about carving your own path that we need to know? Well, I think that we just can't, we can't carve our own path and figure out where we want to go if we're still faking it till we make it, right? Like you can't carve a path to making it if you're faking something else because then you're not trying on new things and you're not figuring out what works for you. You know, if you are carving, you know, if you're listening to the, to the English teacher or the math teacher and, you know, you're, you're just going in the wrong direction. So I think it does start with ignoring everybody. And when you do that, it allows, once you start failing to live up to everybody expect everyone else's expectations and everyone else's definition of success, you can make space for your own. And once you've made space for your own definition of success, that's when you really begin to carve your own path. Which leads me to my favorite part, and that is live your best life. So how do you give permission to your readers and the people who hear you speak to live their best life? Well, So you heard me say this in Austin, and I would imagine that the group of people around you probably had the same reaction. You know, I think, I think the word ambition has gotten a really bad rap. Like it's a dirty word and it's a dirty word for all of us because we're supposed to be like hashtag humble brag. And, you know, with the (laughs) exception of, again, the, you know, the, the jets and the, (laughs) and the, uh, and the cars. But I think, I mean, even Gary V who's like all over the internet about like hustle, hustle, hustle. Even he's saying practice kindness and, and, and fail and, 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 you know, it's okay to, you know, it's like, we should like be humble in your success. Even he's doing this now. So, you know, this whole, this whole faux humility thing, that's more socially acceptable than ambition. And especially if you're a woman, oh, she's so ambitious, right? Like nobody says that about guys, but it, <laughs> it gets a really bad rap. And so what I ask people who are like, oh, I don't know, I'm not sure. I still need to, you know, be all these things to all these people and make everybody else happy, I say, would having more money, having a bigger platform, having a larger foundation, having a bigger megaphone, having, uh, you know, more resources, whatever it is that you want, allow you to show up better and stronger and more effective for the people that you love and the causes you hold dear? And people go, well, yeah, of Mm. course. And I'm like, good. Then it's not just your ambition, it's your responsibility. And that seems to give people a lot of permission to sort of own this dream, this, this dream that sometimes they hold in so much revere that there's so much reverence that they, they don't even want to speak it out loud because they're, they're almost ashamed to want something that much. But that's what we do as entrepreneurs. We see the world in a way that other people haven't seen it. And we go out and we make it so. And you can't do that if you don't believe that you can be the person to do it, that you were put on this earth to do something different and special and great. And so if you are the kind of person, I mean, Seth Godin talks about this. If, if you've got gifts and you don't put those out there in the world to give to other people, you're actually stealing from everyone else. And, and I love that framework because I do think we are all special. We are all the sum total of the experience and the energy and the influences that we have. And so we have to bring ourselves and show up in our communities in ways that make everybody else better and we all lift each other up well laura i am so glad that our paths crossed and i am so happy that i hung out with you at south by southwest and that i invited you to be a guest on cool things entrepreneurs do i i had to wait a couple of weeks because i had to wait for you to get back from europe and all these book launch parties and all these things but i understand based on the now 52 minutes that we have spent together I realize why this book is doing so well and why you're being booked to speak and while people are falling all over themselves saying, have you read Limitless? Because what you shared on this episode alone, I just want to lean back against the wall here and say, wow. And I think that's going to be the response from the people who listen to the show. So if somebody listened to the show and they're like, oh my God, I have to read Laura's book or I have to book her to speak or I just have to know who she is. I must follow her on Twitter and Instagram. And get a tattoo. And get a tattoo. How how do people find you? Uh, Well, I will say two things. The first is that if people are listening and they're like, huh, 
I don't even know where to start. I created a quiz at LimitlessAssessment.com, and I'll say that again, LimitlessAssessment.com. That takes about 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes. It's got about 60 questions, and it walks you through each of the areas of consonants, how you can find your calling and make sure your work is connected to it and that it's contributing to the life you want and have some control over all of it. Um, and it'll give you a beautiful, a beautiful chart that tells you where you are and gives you some tips. So that's at LimitlessAssessment.com. And then I'm all over social um, at head. Hey, LGO, like, hey there, hey, LGO. They can find me at hey, LGO. And LGO stands for Laura Gassner Otting. That's me. And uh, the books on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, anywhere fine books are sold. And um, if people uh, if people reach out to me and they want to sign copy, I even made temporary tattoos to honor the woman who got a tattoo. So let's back up and not close this episode without talking about that. Tell me about the woman who got the tattoo and how that came about. And I know you have she gave you permission to talk about it. So. Tell us that story really quick before I let you go. Yeah, this is an insane story. There's a woman who I profile in the book whose name is Tara, Tara Diab. And Tara is, she is, uh, she's actually on my women's competitive rowing team. She is a badass uh, crew cut super butch lesbian who literally like drives a Ford F-150 with like the license plate butch on it. I mean, she is like all in carpenter. Um, she is just, she is exactly what you were picturing that she is. And she's covered in tattoos. And the day I met her, I fell madly in love with her because she has across her entire forearm, uh, the word mayhem spelled, spelled out in Scrabble tiles. I mean, she is just absolutely fantastic. And I have never met anybody who lives more in her own consonants, who is her own person than Tara. And when I was thinking about people to interview for the book, I called her up and I was like, would you, you know, would you, would you ever consider it? She was like, hell yeah. We sat down over breakfast and she told me her whole story and I put it in the book. And uh, a, a couple weeks before the book came out, she sent me a video where she uh, she sent it to me and a, a, a bunch of our friends where she was talking about how much this meant to her that I the, the person that I am and the, the, the role model I've been in, in communities and how she's tried to live her life that way. And in fact, she was so honored that I noticed that she did that too and she wanted to continue to live into that person all the time. And she thought, how can I honor this and remind myself of the, the person that I am when I'm at my best and live into this person, lean into that on a daily basis. Um, I'm going to tattoo it on my arm. So she tattooed the limitless infinity sign. It says, I am limitless. And it says, be your own dog underneath it with my initials. And she sent it to me and I literally couldn't speak for like an hour. I was so overwhelmed at, again, the burden of potential of all of it. And it was just, it's kind of an amazing, it's kind of an amazing thing. And what I love about the story even more is that when I was deciding between book covers, it was either going to be a yellow one with the infinity sign or an orange one with these airplanes. And her father was a, a, a fighter pilot and she, she loved the orange one because she wanted to honor her father. So when she put it, she was disappointed I picked the yellow, but when she put it on her arm, she filled in the I am limitless lettering in orange to keep him with her also. <laughs> That is, that is such an awesome story, and I, I, I don't think I've, – I've written several books. Nobody has tattooed the book title uh, on them. I'm like Van Halen. Yes, yeah, 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 <laughs> absolutely. Well, Laura, very few of the episodes of Cool Things Entrepreneurs Do reach an hour in length, and it only happens when I'm having a delightful conversation with somebody. So thank you so much for coming and so openly sharing your journey and your advice and your thoughts and just, just nuggets of inspiration for the little community that we have with Cool Things Entrepreneurs Do. This has been great fun. Um, I, I loved it. Jax, if you're still listening, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing stories from your dad about you kicking butt. And I hope, I hope to hear from people who have listened. And, uh, and if anybody gets a t another tattoo, please, <laughs> please let me know. <laughs> awesome. That, that's not for you, Jackie. Um, so so here's, the, here's the final thing to everybody. If you have listened all the way to this point, I am so grateful uh, let me know that you liked this episode. Reach out to me on Twitter. It's uh, at Tom Singer, T-H-O-M-S-I-N-G-E-R, or at Cool Podcast, because this is the Cool Podcast. Uh, you can find me on all the social medias, Instagram, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, etc. Uh, and if you like the show, jump over to iTunes and leave a review. I get really excited when I see new reviews. And walk around your office and make everybody subscribe because shows get ranked the more people who subscribe. And I've actually had a few people say, I walked around, I got 15 people to subscribe today, and like half of them now listen, you know, listen to the show. So it's, uh, it just makes me happy when I hear those things. Uh, but go out there and take this inspiration that you got from Laura or any other show that you've listened to and go out there and try something new. 
And while you're doing it, have fun along the way. Have a great day. Thank you for being part of the Cool Things Entrepreneurs Do podcast. Without your participation and listening to these conversations, there is no show. Connect with Tom at TomSinger.com and follow him on Twitter at, at TomSinger.com.